uh, session and in this 2021 uh, conference. Um, so uh, today you will see several presentations uh, regarding machine learning and uh, you will see some presenters are available now. I'm Dr. Abu Zeki and I will be um, sharing this session. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone. So presentations uh, will uh, so yeah, welcome everyone. Okay, so should I start? Uh, I think uh, Luis, Carlos, uh, Mark Jr. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can start the presentation. Okay, so uh, I'll try to share it and uh, okay, let me find here. And okay. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. Okay. So uh, in this work, we explore real-time weed detection using computer vision and deep learning. Uh, this, this work was done from me, Luis Carlos, and my advisor, Professor José Alfredo. And what we did... Uh, the world population is expected to achieve around 10 billion people by 2050. Therefore, there's a, a huge and there's a huge challenge of maintaining a high crop yield and yet manage the resources with sustainability. Uh, we can have a lot of losses due to weeds in crops. So generally, if you do not use any type of herbicide or do not do any type of control, you have around 90% of production loss. And another challenge is that most weeds uh, represent some type of resistance for herbicides used commercially, especially glyphosate. So what we did and what we proposed is a custom data set of five weed species that are mainly resistant to glyphosate. And we created this data set using data augmentation. The five weed species are uh, Capinha Zeven, Buva, Capinha Margoso, Capim Pé de Galinha, and Caruru. They are found, uh, they are very broadly found in Brazil. So you basically can find it in every state. And they, they compete, especially with, in soil bean crops for resources, causing losses in production. Uh, regarding the data set, uh, the data set is composed of 2000 images, so 1500 images used for training and 500 images for validation, where 300 images uh, of each species for training, of each which species were used for training and 100 images for validation. Uh, the neural network architecture that we explored was the YOLO V5 architecture. It's a very interesting one because it can be divided in three parts where it has a backbone, which is a CSP dark net, which is now as a cross stage partial network, uh, followed by a path aggregation network. Uh, the path aggregation network helps the the overall CNN architecture uh, have a, a better performance and inference time. So the inference time, it's uh, it's faster. And lastly, the YOLO V5 layer, which is divided in three feature maps. That's important because you can uh, detect images of uh, large and small sizes. So as we, we are talking about with detection, we will work with images with different sizes because we're talking about uh, biological detection. So it can be an older weed image, a younger weed image and have different sizes. Uh, 
in terms of implementations, we explored the four versions of the YOLO v5, where the YOLO v5s is the fastest one, however, is the less accurate. And the YOLO v5x is the slowest one, but is the most accurate, at least according with the comparison comparisons done in the COCO data set. Uh, the COCO data set, just to explain, it's the Microsoft uh, Common Object Context data set. It's widely used for object detection. Uh, we implemented the architectures with and without transfer learning. I will discuss uh, the results following. And in this image, we just have the comparisons of the models in the COCO data set. Uh, so basically for implementation, we use the, the cloud resources. We used Google Colab, the PyTorch framework, and, CU and CUDA, which is usually used for GPU enhancement and, and to run uh, neural networks or any device that you need a uh, graphic card. Uh, here we have the results of the YOLO v5 without transfer learning. So the main results that we explored were the mean average precision, uh, 0 0.5 and 0 point, uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.95. Uh, the mean average precision 0 0.5 and 0 0.95 means that you are uh, given, the network is given steps and you are evaluating this precision according with these steps from 0 0.5 to 0 0.95. So what do I want to show here is that, uh, for example, I have the yellow V5S M, L, and X. Uh, the results here, they none of them presented the mean average precision uh, above the 0 0.5, 0 0.7 mark. So the the models didn't achieve uh, accuracy is about 70%. That's a way to to imagine it without transfer learning. Uh, here I have the confusion matrix, which, gave, which gives a more uh, precise view of, of this uh, object detection results. So, for example, the YOLO V5S uh, performed terribly for BUVA class with only 0 0.37 uh, mean average, average precision. Uh, and the YOLO V5M presented a strong result for Azaven with 0 0.73. Uh, the same happens for YOLO V5L and X. Uh, here, the YOLO V5L presented a better result, however, above, uh, sorry, under the 0 0.5 for BUVA, 0 0.46. And uh, the YOLO V5X presented the best results with uh, the best, the best result for Capim Pé de Galinha with 0 0.84. To summarize uh, these results, uh, a mean accuracy was calculated. So as can be seen in bold here, uh, the yellow V5S had a terrible performance with only 0 0.545 of mean accuracy. And the best performance was achieved by the yellow V5X mm -hmm followed by the YOLO V5M, okay? After that, we used uh, transfer learning, which is basically train the neural network uh, on a pre-existing data set and pre-existing weights. In this case, I used the COCO data set and COCO weights. Uh, two aspects were observed. The neural network achieved better results faster and the results were over the 0 0.7 mark. So we have uh, accuracy above the 70%. Uh, in the confusion matrix, this is more perceptible. So for example, even the YOLO V5S, which achieved the poor, poor results uh, without transfer learning, now presents results 
uh, except by Buva, all above the 0.7 mark. So it's a, it's a neural network that could be applicable for real uh, applications in, in, in the field. Uh, the YOLO V5M presented strong results too. Uh, it, only for Buva it achieved results of 0 0.63, but it's much, much better than the results obtained result without transfer learning. And the same uh, can be seen for the YOLO V5L in X. I also summarized the results in a table, so it's it's easier to understand. Uh, in this case, the Yolo V5M best predicted uh, the classes in the weed species Buva, Capina, and Campina Margoso, and the Yolo V5X uh, best predicted the classes Capina Zeven, Capin Pé de Galinha, and Caruru. Overall, the Yolo V5M presented the best results. It's slightly better than the Yolo V5X. However, it's faster for inference, as can be seen in the next table. So here I have the weights. Uh, after training the neural networks, I, I generate a weights file to run inference locally on my computer. I'm running a, a, a Samsung Odyssey with uh, NVIDIA GTX 1050 graphics card. Uh, and, and here I have the weight size. So uh, the Yolo V5S is around 40, 14 megabytes. And the Yolo V5M is 41, 41 megabytes ar around it. And the Yolo V5X is 171 megabytes. So it's much heavier for local inference. Uh, as I mentioned before, local inference were performed in my computer. So I achieved around 62 FPS for the Yolo V5S and the Yolo V5M, which has the best accuracy, was around 26 FPS. So it's pretty close to 30 FPS, which is considered real time, and yet with strong results. Uh, in this image, I have uh, a representation of what I did to verify if the networks correctly identifying the weed species. So here I have images of Capina Zevain, where, the, where there is the confidence to show of the neural network. I used the confidence to show the 0 0.4. So here for Zevain, it, it's around 0 0.57. So it's over the 50% mark of confidence. For Buva, it has a even higher confidence. And for Capina Margoso, Capin Pé de Galinha, and Caruru, uh, it, it has a confidence around 0 0.5, and for Caruru, 0 0.6. Uh, another aspect to, to mention is that the neural network correctly detected the images even when I, I turn the, the cell phone and with different light conditions. So this is important to, to measure the robustness of the model. And finally, what we claim is that we are proposing a custom data set, which is uh, freely available on, Cal on Kaggle uh, for all five with species resistant to major commercial herbicides. Uh, the architectures correctly detect the weeds when using uh, transfer learning, even the YOLO V5S, uh, which has the lowest accuracy, and achieved real-time weed detection, where the YOLO V5S achieved 62 FPS on images, on, on better on video, with 480 by 6, 640 uh, pixels. And the best uh, architecture was the YOLO V5M, achieving an accuracy of 0 0.77, and 26 uh, frames per second. Well, uh, that's it. Thank you for your time and attention. If you have doubts.
Um, Dr. Barari, I think you are muted. Muted? Hi. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, thank you. Hi, Dr. Awuzaki. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry for Hi. being late at the beginning. There was a plenary uh, talk from um, eight to, uh, 9 to 10 Brazilian time. I was co-chairing there, but just a just few minutes delay happened. Thank you, Dr. Abuziki, for starting the event. I appreciate it. And um, I guess uh, to follow the pattern of the sessions, we start the videos now. The short videos, three uh, minutes videos, uh, will be played. And then after that, we can uh, check questions for every single paper and then uh, have the discussions after that. So um, I think um, it's a good time right now to start the videos. Hello, my name is Thiago Americano do Brasil, and I'm going to briefly introduce the main aspects of our paper called Detection of High Impedance Faults in Primary Distribution Grid Using Support Vector Machines Classification in this short presentation. Service continuity of the power distribution systems is commonly affected by several shortages. One of the most problematic incidents is the high impedance faults which usually happens after an energized overhead conductor is ruptured and touches the ground consequently. This event is normally accompanied by an electric arc, representing hazard to people, animals and overall physical infrastructure. As seen in these two photos, a high impedance fault across the distribution grid may be caused by direct contact with trees, for example, photo in the left, or due to a falling conductor, photo on the right. This way, the questions we try to answer with this work are How can electric power utilities detect more accurately the occurrence of such events? How to establish a classification system that is able to correctly differentiate between a high impedance fault event and a normal transient event of the network, avoiding unnecessary alarm. This work tried to establish answers to these questions. Considering a general current measurement point, the monitored variable can be based on the residual current, which is the sum of currents from phases A, B, and C at that point, and the short time Fourier transform is used for the fit restriction stage and is responsible for dividing this measured signal into several smaller segments of equal length, deploying the conventional Fourier transform on each of these segments individually. From there, the fit restriction obtains new features from transforming its original input signal. On the other hand, the feature selection is achieved when a certain number of relevant characteristics are chosen. In general, it is important to consider the use of the lowest number of characteristics as possible. The developed system must be able to distinguish HIFs from other transients of common occurrence in a distribution system, such as in rush currents, capacitor switching, and load switching, for instance to avoid false tripping. This stage is performed by the support vector machines classifier.
Hello, my name is Cody Berry, and today I'll be presenting the paper Fighting COVID, an autonomous indoor cleaning robot supported by artificial intelligence and vision for dynamic air disinfection. You can see the team members' names here. There's a lot of them, so I won't list them. We're all from Ontario Tech University, working for AD2M Labs. So COVID-19 took the world by storm, as we all know, and it really highlighted the necessity of disinfection and making sure that we don't spread diseases between people so that we don't get into these types of situations again. Uh, there already exist solutions for disinfection of rooms, but a lot of the times these are static devices that need to be placed by humans, uh, and they can be dangerous in some instances for UV light, basically. So what we're trying to do here is add intelligence to these disinfection systems. So we want to develop a robotic platform for air disinfection where humans are present. We want to make sure this is safe, we want to make sure that it's effective at disinfecting the room. So we want to make sure that we're not hitting them, the humans, or exposing them to harmful UV rays. So we have here on the left a CAD model of our robot, and on the right-hand side we have our alpha prototype. It went very successfully. So we are able to do slab mapping, both 2 and 3D. Uh, so on the right-hand side here we have a, a video of the robot going through the process of slam, just figuring out where it is, it's mapping the room, uh, and so this allows us to do object avoidance. You can see that there's green lines through some of the black uh, points. That basically tells us where our boundaries are. And so with multiple robots doing this multiple times a day, we can actually keep fairly updated maps uh, of where things happen to be so robots can more easily avoid them and be more efficient in their movement. Here we have a couple of pictures from the 3D slam mapping. Uh, this is useful for human detection. So we can run different human detection algorithms on point clouds like this and know where humans are in the space. We also want to make sure that our filter was effective enough, and so we ran airflow simulation. So basically we were pulling air in through the bottom. It's passed through HEPA filter and subjected to UVC light, which is all completely self-contained. So we collect the virus and then we kill it inside the robot without any UV light escaping to the surrounding area. We've also got IoT connectivity, so we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. This gives us status updates from the robot to allow us to know where it is, how it's doing, whether or not there's any, any kind of trouble, and then we can share this information with other robots in the area. So in conclusion, we developed a low-cost robotic platform for air disinfection. We've got the basics of autonomous navigation completed, including SLAM. Uh, we've also implemented IoT to allow for communications from the robot to a base station and vice versa. Uh, and our future work is going to involve implementing the human detection and creating more robots to allow for distributed disinfection planning uh, in a prototype stage. Thank you. present this work about output feedback controller design for quadratic cost minimization for linear systems with polytopic uncertainties. There has been an increase in the development of technologies that allow structures to be more stable, and many efforts have been taken to develop some structural control systems into feasible technology. These controllers have to act on the structure so that the set absorb and dissipate energy in a stable way. In this work, sufficient conditions will be used based on linear matrix inequalities 
to control the linear system with output feedback. It is also used an algorithm of differential evolution to find values of some parameters that are not determined by solvers. So, in this work, theorem 1 is proposed, and the following LMIs can be obtained. The practical implementation of the controller proposed was tested in a system that simulates a flexible building controlled by a mobile active mass damper located at the top. The system can be approached by uh, the model of a standard mass spring system. As a disturbance, a sine wave shown in the figure 2 was used to represent an earthquake. The results presented for the position of the top floor in the system are composed by three different types of tests. The first one is the open loop system that is performed in passive mode using a PID controller as a way to leave the car in a mobile state. The second one is shown in the left figure that shows the system in a closed loop and the right figure shows the system with a fault of 14% in the actuator. A new procedure that aims to minimize the energy of the output signal and the control signal is proposed in this paper. A decay rate could be specified to improve the speed of the response of the system. And using an algorithm of differential evolution, it was possible to obtain a lower cost value that leads to a minimization of the guarantee cost, getting a reduction of the oscillations and reaching the steady state faster. From the implementation, it is possible to notice, even with the fault in the signal control, the control system reduces the unwanted oscillations and vibrations in the structure. Thank you for your attention. In this video, I will introduce our work, Real-Time Downhole Geosteering Data Processing Using Deep Neural Networks on FPGA. Geosteering is an essential drilling service of adjusting the well trajectory on the fly to reach a geological target. An efficient and accurate inverse algorithm enables geosteering by using logging data to reconstruct the formation structure. However, because solving geosteering inverse problem is computationally expensive, and due to the limitation of downhole computing resources, existing geosteering inversion programs are performed on the surface using the sensed data transmitted from downhole to surface. Since the maximum data rate in this scenario is at 20 bits per second, data transmission from the downhole to the surface incurs serious delays. This bottleneck often leads to wrong dual decision making. In this paper, we propose to use a DNN to better solve the inverse problem and execute 
locally on FPGA board, which is deployed on the downhole drilling device. In this case, the collected sensing data can be locally processed and generate geosteering information, which significantly reduces the delays. To efficiently execute the target DNN, we analyze the current computation mapping method and pick the optimal one for the target network. The current computation mapping method can be categorized into three types. We analyze the P utilization level of different types of mapping method and select the best one. Based on the selected mapping method, we prototype an entire hardware design on FPGA and execute the target network. We further design a customized hardware module for a special instance organization layer in the target network. In our experiment results, we show that the overall implementation does not occupy too much resource on board. And our proposed FPGA implementation achieves significant reduction in both latency and energy. We further conduct scalability analysis and overhead analysis. For more details, welcome to the Industrial Conference. Thank you. Hello, I am Mahmoud Sayyidi, a PhD student at Ontario Tech University, and my conference paper entitled Neural Network Signal Processing in Spark Assisted Chemical Engraving Micromachining. Shake is a technology based on an electrochemical discharge phenomenon, applying voltage between two electrodes that are dipped inside an electrolyte causes bubbles formation, and the bubbles coalesce into a gas field in a critical voltage and it brings discharges. Discharges are etched in the workpiece, which is a non-conductive material, and is placed below the tool electrode. Because the gas well is needed to discharge a current, and the discharges are the heat source in this process, unstable gas will bring an interrupt heat source. As a result, for more efficient machining, we need a more stable heat source by stabilizing the gas well. So we have created a robust, fast, and accurate algorithm for detecting gas in regions. Artificial neural network is also used in this algorithm. In this study, signal processing is carried out based on the following flowchart. After initialization in the first step and filtering in the second one, the algorithm detects the eczema points in the third step. The algorithm uses these points and alpha, beta, and theta parameters to detect the gas film formation regions in the fifth step by applying the illustrated condition. Alpha, beta, and theta are specific, which have been estimated in the fourth step by an artificial neural network. Sixth step is for elimination of falsely detected regions in the previous step. Seventh step is for segments enhancement and the algorithm calculates the gas mill formation time in step number 8. As mentioned before, the fourth step of the algorithm is an ANN 
which is predicting the alpha, beta, and theta, which are specific for each data set. The problem is time series. So the network is a recurrent neural network. And sequence layer, LSTM layer, and regression layer are used in this network. 126 datasets of pulse voltage input with various conditions are recorded. 80% of datasets used for training and the rest used for testing. The desired responses of the trained ANN are alpha, beta, and theta, which are calculated manually. And RMSE is used to estimate the ANN error. Figure 9 shows one sample of results of the ANN. Here we can see the true values and predictive values for three parameters and gas mean formation time. As you can see, the average error for all parameters are acceptable. In conclusion, the developed algorithm works properly and it's steady. It could be used for other types of input voltage of static machining. Thank you for the uh, for the videos. Um, now that uh, we saw the short videos, I think we can start to do uh, the comments and questions for the papers. Uh, all the authors are on board. That's that's great. So this is easier to. The uh, author of the first paper, please have the microphone uh, on. Yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, let me know if there is any question for Mark. on the wheat detection system. I think it's Luis Carlos, isn't it? Yes. We have some uh, background noise, if, um, if I understand the reflection of the... Yeah, please try, uh, is it better now? Thank you. So um, let me start with a question about the uh, wheat uh, detection algorithm. Uh, I really like to know um, how is the uh, sensitivity of the net to uh, quality of the pictures, like in terms of the uh, orientation of your uh, view, the uh, lighting, how, how, how sensitive is your algorithm to, to the images, basically, to the quality? Okay. So uh, this was explored too, especially we, we, we decided to create a real-time application. Uh, what was noticed is that uh, we were able to achieve results above the threshold of 40% of accuracy. 
but we did not achieve the results above the 70% of accuracy. What this means, for example, if I present uh, uh, an image of a weed that the neural, neural network did not see, it mostly will identify it if it's in the five species that we use it, but it, for example, will not achieve 75%, 80% accuracy but it will be able to identify it at different lighting conditions except night because we didn't use uh, night images for our data set but it will effectively effectively use it with different uh, flips and and different light conditions mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, do you consider it a fault of uh, the network or it is just a fault of taking the pictures, like just the images, photography, basically? Uh, definitely. Uh, we would definitely we will explore more images, especially uh, take images from the, from the field. This will definitely add more uh robustness for our network uh something that we will explore in the next uh, works that we will we'll do is use active learning because we are uh studying uh biological uh things so we can uh collect more data according to a time series and make mm -hmm. if uh, and see if the net neural network will be more robust or if the results will still be the same, and then we'll have to explore another neural network. Uh, you already uh, explored several networks here, correct? In, in the comparison between the uh, networks that you tried, and the results are very different. Yep, uh, all the neural networks are YOLO v5 models. But the difference is the number of training parameters, especially the YOLO V5S is the fastest, has less training parameters. Uh, and the YOLO V5X, according with the COCO, Microsoft COCO dataset, is the most accurate. However, is the slowest one. In our tests, we found out that the YOLO V5M was the best for our dataset because it achieved around 26 FPS and 0 0.77 uh, mean accuracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, any um, other questions for this paper from the audience? Thank you much. Um, I, I think it's, it was a very good uh, work and it has definitely a lot of applications. We, we are uh, working currently on something uh, very similar, but is for the, uh, to, to help a robot that is doing the uh, backyard maintenance of the dealing with the weeds and just understanding the locations for removing the weeds. But um, definitely, I think uh, this is a very important and useful result that you achieve. Thank you very much. So uh, we, we can switch to a uh, second paper now with the um, topic of <clears throat> uh, detection of high impedance fault. Uh, so um, any question? For, for the for the author there's no problem if you make questions <laughs> it's okay yes. is there any question so I guess um, again I can uh, look at the aspect of the accuracy I like just apparently, the um, 
damage can be significant right so when when the problem happens like a fault happened for high ambulance you may have severe damages in comparing comparison to the previous uh, topic like mm -hmm. detection of the weed so if you don't detect one of the weeds is not the end of the world but it's here you, yeah. yeah so yeah. so what is the uncertainty and accuracy and how you want to make sure that this is minimum in your uh, in your design okay let me make, make a brief uh, introduction about the, the aspect uh, here in brazil especially in developing countries it is very common that overhead conductors that are energized in the distribution grids fall they rupture and then they fall and sometimes it starts fire and it can it doesn't disconnect from the grid automatically because the current that it generates uh, has the uh, almost the same magnitude as the nominal currents from the feeder so the protection system is usually not sensitized so the overcurrent relays and the fuses do not blow when this happens so this can damage uh, people uh, animals and overall public infrastructure uh, so uh, this is a big problem nowadays uh, for uh, for the the companies that generates our energy so uh, we are starting to to look at uh, some specialties that happened uh, uh, harmonic content that happens uh, in this generated uh, residual current from this fault. Uh, it presents usually uh, third harmonic, fifth harmonic, and up to uh, 11th harmonic. So it's very important to look not just for the magnitude of the currents, but to the harmonic content overall of these uh, acquired currents, acquired uh, residual currents. So the machine learning is used to differentiate uh, HIF events, uh, high impedance fault events, and a normal event, because normal events such as uh, capacitor switching and some currents that are generated when you turn on a transformer, a no load or low load transformer, that is the inrush current, generates the uh, almost uh, equal harmonic content to the high impedance fault. So you need a specialized system to, to be able to classificate what is a HIF event and what is not a HIF event in order to not uh, put an alarm uh, mm -hmm. with no need. That would be uh, bad if you turn off the, the distribution grid with no necessity, with no need. Perfect. So at the moment, um, to, to implement this, what sort of infrastructure needed in terms of uh, sensors and uh, logistics that you need to add? Yes, yes. One of the important points is that usually this kind of, of measurement is done by a current transformer. Mm -hmm. And current transformers are usually limited to the frequency bands of the input signal. So it would be very nice to, to add uh, uh, another kind of measurement that is able to, to read that harmonic level, that high harmonic level orders that unfortunately the current transformers uh, are not able to that would enhance even more that uh, our our propose mm -hmm. but in that case you just need one sensor per line or like how, how what is the distance that you need to install this how often do you at need least to... one uh, one measurement that is uh, you have to pick the currents from the three phases, phases A, B, and C, and then sum them. 
and then you 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 got the residual currents. Uh, in our tests, it was we were able to see that even with this measurement, with the residual current measurement, we could detect uh, at least 90% of the cases of uh, high impedance faults just by the harmonic content and the classification done by the support vector machines. Perfect. Very interesting. Uh, thank you very much. A any any other question for uh, Mr. Uh, Tiago? Thank you. I think we have a little bit quiet uh, audience, set of group of quiet audience here today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. So um, our um, third paper is... Uh, about the uh, autonomous uh, robot for disinfection, COVID disinfection. Uh, any question for Mr. Cody Berry? I have a question, a few questions. <laughs> sure. Okay, so please, thanks for uh, the... Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the interesting uh, presentation. It's such an interesting topic as well. Um, so uh first um can you please explain about what kind of sensors you used uh so that the uh, for, for the robot to function and the second question is about disinfecting so you said that there's a filter simulation about the, the air quality that was done uh regarding filtering the air from the bacteria so um what are the limitations of your system and how many robots you need like how do you determine how many robots you need for a certain space because so, it differs, right depending on how big the space is that you are disinfecting yes so it's dependent not just on the space but also the the density of the people within the space more people right. breathing more robots required um as of right now that part hasn't been calculated that's still something we're working on we've developed the first robot um and then we're going to start going into the swarm uh aspect of it in the coming months um, it's a capstone project actually at Ontario Tech, so we're still developing it uh, in an ongoing basis. Um, as for sensors, we have a Intel RealSense camera, which is a, a depth camera. So it gives us a 3D point cloud based on um, uh, basically sends it a laser and it measures the deviation in the points in the pictures, uh, like an IR laser, so it won't affect any people. Um, so that's the, that's the sensing. Uh, we also have a particle sensor on it to detect any kind of particles in the air. Um, I, I believe the sensor we currently have is working on slightly larger particles than COVID-19 just for cost measures, um, but we can still utilize that to um, analyze the air quality. Uh, and then I, I believe you asked a question also about the disinfection process. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what we have is uh, that that image you sh you saw there was an airflow simulation through the filter and so basically it's drawing in air up through the bottom and then all that air is pushed through a hepa filter which is rated to scrub down to the particle size required for covid 19. Um, and so basically it's bringing it through trapping all the particles in that filter and releasing cleaned air out the top again and then we have a UV light system inside to then kill any particles collected on that HEPA filter. So in order to increase the shelf life of it, basically. Um, so that we don't have to replace components all that often. Right. So as the robot is moving in the room, you are disinfecting, right? Yes. But do you do like, again, a check, for example, would the robot turn around and do another like round to check the, the, the air quality or or just do one round? So as of right now, I believe the plan we'd come up with was to bring the robot into an area and park it for the time being to just start processing. Because in, in a hospital environment, you always have people running around everywhere and we don't want these to get in the way. Uh, so that's one of our biggest concerns is if we start to interfere with doctors and nurses doing their jobs, then we've created a, an, an additional problem for them that we don't want to make. Um, so as of right now, they're meant to come into an area and uh, disinfect stationary while moving out of the way if necessary. And with those multiple robots in the area, um, depending on the uh, density, of course, you'll have multiple points of 
sensing. So we can see in say three or four different areas what the air quality is like and whether or not we can stay in the area. Um, the, if, if say we're in like a, um, a hospital room just got turned down for uh, patients left or something, in that case, you probably only need the one robot. And in that case, yes, it would make sense to drive around and just sample the air, the air in multiple areas, as opposed to just assuming that our robots got the entire room based on one data point. Right. Especially depending on where you are looking, like if it's in the hallway or it's yeah. in, a, uh, in a different uh, room, like where there are patients. Yeah, it's, really it's, nice. it's hard to check with limited data. Yeah, but it's interesting, but, like, you know, um, uh, the plan is to have multiple robots, right, that communicate yeah. with each other. And basically, you would be sending the robots to different locations based on the need, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, regarding the error, so how, how accurate the robot um, is in detecting uh, obstacles as well? Uh, so it's pretty good at detecting obstacles uh, using the, the SLAM algorithm. Um, it's very good at mapping out and avoiding stationary obstacles at the moment. Um, but again, hospitals are dynamic environments. And so that's, there was a, a portion there where I talked about updating those slam maps because as people move around, as objects move around, those maps need to be continually updated to avoid, uh, obstacles. Um, so it's pretty good at that. It's, it's constantly pinging the environment in order to see what kind of changes there are and rerouting itself based on that. Uh, the biggest factor there that we're still working on is the human component. So objects fine humans are a lot more dynamic than most things in that environment and so we're still trying to with the, the 3d point cloud and with some computer vision techniques trying to identify people uh to make it even more robust and avoiding them uh so that again that's something we're still working on very interesting thank you so much for the clarification no worries thank you thank you for the questions dr abuziki uh, so uh we move to our next paper about the uh, quadratic cost minimization. Um, any question for um, Ms. Tamaris? So let me um, ask this, um, how, how the uh, cost is minimized? Like I, I didn't get that part about your work, like about the cost minimization itself how how the minimization is cost happening mm -hmm. so the cost can can be minimized by using the approach that i described it in the paper so i use it an approach using a mice output feed effect decay rates perform index and so uh join all these parameters and and we use it to um, an algorithm of differential evolution to obtain a lower cost value to improve the system response. And I, mm -hmm. I ask you the question. Yes, yeah, so the, uh, maybe I should ask this way, like what is the cost uh, function, like the, the function of cost? How do you calculate cost basically? The, uh, can I share my my screen? I, I think so. Yes, if if it's possible, and you can just go to the share button there. You see the share button. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. So uh, we use a parameter. That is a, an upper bound of the cost. So uh, this is the parameter beta. And after I propose the theorem one, uh, it, it serves as, as an upper bound, and all the all the the theorem concludes that. Uh, is the the main the main upper bound of the the function? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So parameter beta is um, is is not a parameter that you calculate. Is is a threshold that you consider here for the cost. Yeah, it, the parameter beta. Mm -hmm. uh, it's calculated by the algorithm of differential evolution. Oh, okay. Okay. So beta is calculated or yes. Yeah. And it leads to a lower cost value than the, if we, we chose a random value for this. Okay. Perfect. Um, I have a, another question here. Um, if I can. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Um, so on figure three, um, you said position, uh, the title of the figure, position of the top floor and control system from test using the shake table to the design controller. So uh, my question is, how did you test your system? Like how did, what kind of input um, you tested the system on? Is as the model of the system how, how I tested it. Yeah. Hmm? How did you test uh, the performance? Uh, yeah. Yeah, of your controller. Can I show you again my screen? Because you so, are saying that even with the forty percent fault, uh, the the design controller can eliminate the the oscillations. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm wondering, mm -hmm. like, what kind of input you applied? Mm -hmm. um, we model this type of our system, and we implement it in this this one floor IMD system. And uh, this simulates um, a one floor with an active uh, with a mobile mass at the top. So. By using softwares like Simulink and MATLAB, we can test the controller in the system. And after that, we, we can obtain some results. Did you, did you test the controller for a wide range of inputs or like for a specific um, magnitudes, basically yeah. of vibrations? Mm -hmm. We use this type of input in the system uh, of that the system that I showed earlier. So it's a sine wave yes. with a frequency. And the, the results uh, obtained from this model was this one. So Right. Uh, so basically your system, uh, you, you tested only for one frequency or you did it for a range of frequencies? Uh, just for this frequency. Okay. Just for this input because I, I wanted to ask you, like, at what frequency it starts becoming unstable? Like, did you did you have the opportunity to test this, or you just focused on one frequency? Yeah, we just uh, tested for this frequency, mm -hmm. and I guess uh, after some time it it turns stable. Okay, uh, it's, it's not um, a sign that that amplifies. Uh, until the infinity is just this frequency and this this type, but and, and uh, you choose this frequency randomly, or you targeted a specific frequency. Like how how did you choose this? Yeah, we we choose this just to illustrate this this type of test. Okay. But uh, this controller can can be used to many frequencies and. But we not tested in this paper. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I also have a quick question for Tamias. Uh, yeah, I really like to know that uh, uh, how long does it take to solve the minimization problem on your controller? So, is it a computationally expensive process? Uh -huh. I guess the the part that takes more time is to to model the controller, and after that you just have to to program in MATLAB and export to Simulink, and I guess it, when you when you run the the program program the program. It takes um, less than 
30 minutes to to obtain the results. Okay, uh, but, it, but it's not uh, done in real time, right? You you do it uh, offline. Offline? Yeah, yeah. Um, you do it before. Mm -hmm. We program it. Uh, first, we program the controller. And after that, we implement it in this, this model. Okay. And yeah, it can be separate parts. Okay, okay. Understand. Thank you. Amiris, yeah. can I make you a question? Yes, sure. Uh, it's regarding what Juan was talking right now. Uh, did you test your controller directly on your plant or did you use it some kind of uh, harden the loop, something like that? Some sorry. Hard in the loop. Did you emulate your plant firstly, or did you use the the controller directly on your physical plants? Ah, I understand. I, I simulated earlier uh, by mm -hmm. using a toolbox in Simulink, mm -hmm. and we we saw the results. And after that, we tried to improve the these responses. And after. Uh, getting a better result or the best result, we implement it on the, the plant of this model. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? method by Mr. Van. Any question for this paper? Hello? Am I, uh, do you hear me at all? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, for, for the question on uh, for the paper on geo steering, one thing uh, that I like to know is how um, this FPGA is uh, customized. Like, like you have a uh, DNN as your network, and then you want to customize uh, the uh, the FPGA based on that. So how yeah. customized it is. Uh, can you explain a little bit about the customization process? Sure. Uh, for example, if you want to run a DNN on an FPGA, uh, first, uh, you need to have uh, a controller on your FPGA, and you have a, you need to design uh, lots of processing elements uh, to compute the uh, uh, calculation, to do the calculations. Mm -hmm. Because uh, steering inference needs a lot of uh, convolution operations, and so that, that, that mostly uh, composed of the uh, add and uh, multi multiplications. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a uh, lots of uh, computation units. We call it processing elements uh, to do the calculation, and uh, we basically use a controller to control the compu computation units to run uh, convolution operations. And that's the uh, fundamental uh, operations of a DNA inference. Okay. Yeah. So exactly based on your, sorry for interrupting you, but just I want to, exactly based on the uh, layers that exist, uh, your input and your output, you design the FGPA exactly based on these requirements. Yes. Well, our our FPG design is targeted on our uh, geostealy network. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if if you have to change anything in your network, then you have to revise the entire FGPA, correct? Yes, because FPG is reconfigurable. Mm -hmm. So so that if we have a different task, uh, I can uh, regenerate our design uh, on FPG. It's flexible. Mm -hmm. But this is a great achievement, like seven times faster or 
82% less uh, energy consumption, these are very good uh, results, basically. So it works yes. with a little bit of uh, customization. Yeah. Uh, that's right, because FPGA is customized so mm -hmm. that uh, it will be much more efficient than uh, CPU and GPU because CPU and GPU, they are the general purpose processor. Mm -hmm. But FPGA, we customize it to do the DNN task. So it's like a specific uh, purpose design. Okay. So, so in principle, uh, FPGA will be much more faster than mm -hmm. other platforms. The other thing that I'm curious about is the cost. Uh, how much how much does it cost uh, comparing to a regular CPU or GPU? Uh, for example, a CPU, if you run one image uh, of our DNN on CPU, uh, it, it costs like uh, uh, 30 or even 40 milliseconds, uh, but on FPGA it's just... No, no, not, not the computation, just the hardware cost. Uh, you mean like power? No, just the price of the hardware. A price? Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, a cost. Uh, FPGA is usually much cheaper than a CPU. The price. The price is much uh, lower than the CPU. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. And is there any limitation in terms of the networks, like? Can it be used for any type of neural network, or you see some limitations there? Uh, uh, actually, uh, our design is focused on our target DNA network. So maybe it's not very efficient for other uh, tasks, uh, but uh, we believe that our designed FPJ is uh, very efficient on the geostealing uh, service. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question for Mr. Wang? Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we have a, few, a couple of minutes only for the last paper now for uh, SEG process and the neural network application. Any question for uh, for the last paper, please? So I guess um, I should ask this quick question, uh, Mahmoud, that uh, what is the next step in your uh, neural network? So now that you are understanding the, uh, basically the, um, the behavior of the uh, signals, like what, how you want to use it in improving the process? Yeah, but, uh, as you, as mentioned in the, Presentation to search is a emerging technology, so there isn't any comprehensive uh, study about that. So we need to uh, uh, we need to investigate different conditions. That different condition, how they uh, are affecting the uh, quality of the uh, quality of the cutting. So uh, we have to uh, do different experiments and analyze the signals in order to understand how the situations are uh, working. So uh, it can help us during different experiments in order to analyze the uh, data, capture data uh, quickly, in a quick time without wasting time for manual uh, calculation or manual estimation. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the future, in the, if we can uh, find reasonable results, we can use it for uh, monitor online manufacturing because as I mentioned uh, the quality of the gas bin is uh, affecting the quality of the machine that it means that if during the if we can stabilize the gas bin we can achieve uh, better results so if we can uh, understand how the gas bin uh, its stabilization are uh, affecting the workers during the machining, we can control the different uh, input parameters like voltage, uh, tool depth, tool rotation, and any other parameter that are changeable during the machining in order to uh, improve the cutting, at least uh, any mm -hmm. machine, micro machine. 
So um, if I'm right, the, right now, uh, with this data analysis, you understand when the gas film is created, for what period of time you have the gas film. Yes, uh, gas film formation time. Gas film formation is one Forming. of the time. Yeah, gas film formation time, we can uh, analyze it. And uh, maybe in the next step, we can uh, figure out the uh, other parameters, the gas film lifetime. It's something and other things that's so yes yeah, so this is this is what i like to hear like just mm -hmm. how how you can connect the physical parameters to this result like just right now you you know when the gas formation is happening but if you want to uh, understand why why is happening this long why is not longer or shorter like I how have after the gas film, there are some other uh, peaks that they were sparks, and the sparks are the heat source of the machining, as you know. And if we can analyze the sparks, actually we can uh, actually we can uh, find out the potential of the sparks, and know how they are uh, the potential or the energy source that is etching the glass. So if okay. I can just jump in here, um, so of course we need like the, the we need a stable gas film because without the gas film we cannot have sparks. And as Mahmoud said, if there are no sparks, so there's no heat source, and so the process doesn't work because it's basically chemical. It's an etching process that's thermally uh, accelerated. So without these discharges, machining cannot go on. And so Mahmoud started to create an algorithm to detect the gas film formation. So he's gonna, he did it for like just um, one signal. And, um, and then he's gonna study for other type of signals and parameters, um, how much the gas film can stay and how much is the energy of these discharges. So if we can make even more discharges, so higher energy source. And then basically he's gonna test the results when machining. So he's gonna study how um, basically for different conditions. And when you have, as you were mentioning, like longer lifetime, shorter formation time, um, higher intensity discharges, how this will affect the machining the progress and quality. So when he does the machine, this is the next step when he's applying it to machining. That's when he will test and he will just um, correlate the signal with the quality, basically, and the and the speed of machining. I think this, uh, that would be next. But regarding the algorithm, Mahmoud, can you talk about the algorithm? How satisfactory is it? It is for us. And um, what are you going to do further to enhance the algorithm? Like next uh, steps. Do you mean I explain about the current algorithm or the next? Yeah, the current algorithm. So is it the, uh, so we will move on with this algorithm or you have plans to even enhance the algorithm? Uh, of course, I need to enhance the algorithm. It's just for uh, detecting gas film formation, but uh, I have to uh, extend it to be able to uh, calculate the uh, gas film lifetime or the discharges, the, the number of discharges, their potential. And after that, uh, I think it's something complete in order to uh, use for different type of the uh, voltage, different types. Yeah, and I think at some point while machining, you want, you want to analyze the signal during machining as well, because there we are, we are thinking we can find like some information about how machining is progressing or quality of the structure while machining so yeah. that would be a bit more complex this is the next step but as a first step he was just studying the discharges and gas film offline without machining yes uh, after, if we can find the uh, reasonable uh, data uh, results uh, we can apply it for the real sake machine in order to see the if the uh, achieved uh, optimized uh, condition uh, brings better quality for real gas film or the real glass as a vortex. Right. Great. Thank you very much. I think uh, we had good discussions on um, all the papers and uh, these are very um, innovative works, although 
in different directions and different applications, but all have the same essence of uh, neural network application and learning and understanding the behavior of something that is difficult to understand. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, any any comment or question? I guess we already passed the time, so we should dismiss this session at this time. Thank you, and it was nice uh, seeing you all in this. Thank event. you, everyone, for the interesting presentations. And nice to see you all. Nice to see you, Ahmed, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.